So speed, performance, and uh, human perception. So we know that performance matters, and performance can make or break your app. The trouble is, performance means many different things to many different people. So it's a very challenging subject to talk about. If, uh, or as you heard earlier this morning, uh, you talk to the people building, the engineers building the actual platform, and they'll regale you with stories around all the crazy things that we have to do to make the platform fast, from parsers to lexers to asm to uh, all of these other things. And then they'll tell you that now they have to, having to rethink all of that platform because now we have these mobile phones with multi-core, which is making them reconsider all of their architectural decisions. You have uh, energy constraints, RAM usage, and all of this kind of stuff. So that by itself is a very big uh, thing. Of course, that's not the full story because, well, you got to ship this thing over this uh, series of tubes on the internet. So people like myself will spend hours upon hours telling you that it's all about latency, bandwidth, and protocols, and you really need to optimize about uh, optimize and think about all that stuff. But you know, even then, once you've shipped all of those bytes, well, you got to execute those bytes. So those things. Uh, get to uh, JavaScript speed and ASM and uh, GC performance. And, but even then, you're not done. Because you've executed all of this code, that's fine. But you also got to have the presentation layer. So we got to talk about CSS and selector matching and style calculations and layout and painting. And finally, uh, the more business-minded of us will say, look, this is all great. You've optimized all this stuff. But really what matters, what really matters, what performance is all about, is all about visits, its engagement, and its conversions. Because ultimately, you can build a really fast thing that doesn't, if it doesn't achieve these goals, uh, it's no good. And the trouble is, each one of these layers is actually very, very deep. So it's a very complicated subject. And I can tell you that from firsthand experience, because after walking up and down the stack for a couple of years, I decided, hey, I'm going to sit down and like, really try to figure out at least one of these layers. So I pitched this like, short little book on browser networking to O'Reilly. And much to their chagrin, I then went on to write 404 pages, which seems like an appropriate number of pages for a book about HTTP, come to think of it. So it's complicated, right? And uh, when we talk about performance, it is a fast-moving target. You can spend full time on any one of these layers and still not know everything that's going on. So a natural question is, is there such thing as fast enough? Right? We can always make things faster. When I was writing the book, the reason I kept adding more and more content is because I kept realizing there's always one more gotcha, there's always one more tip, there's always one more thing that I could add to make it a little bit faster. And context matters, right? So you take two examples. For example, in a game, you're building a game. One of the core things that you're going to be focusing on there is FPS. And if you know about FPS and you've ever built a game, you'll know that tens of milliseconds make all the difference. 10 milliseconds can take a great game and turn it into a bad game. It can actually induce nausea if you do it wrong. Whereas 10 milliseconds on an e-commerce site, because you have some animations, are probably inconsequential. In fact, in this particular example, Hardgraft, a uh, beautiful e-commerce site, responsive, works great, uh, and they have these nice animations as you scroll down. It doesn't matter, because when, I, when you actually go to checkout, they have a seven-step process for the checkout process, which is rather painful. So it actually say that performance, obviously, is different between these two cases. So there is no just one single metric. And part of the problem here is, as engineers, we've been trained to think about uh, the the silicon that's, that's writing or that's running all of our uh, applications here. So we optimize for milliseconds, for kilo kilobytes, the frames per second, and all the rest. And oftentimes, we actually forget about the wetware that is sitting on the other end of that interaction, which, by the way, has some really bizarre firmware running it. As far as I can tell, it must be some modified version of IE6, which is to, which is to say you, have, you ain't seen nothing yet. It's some crazy stuff in there. So let's talk about the wetware, right? Regardless of the platform, uh, if you do user studies, you will find that most people, when, when you talk about task-oriented things, something that you have an intent, you do an action, and then you have to wait for the response, and you have to process that response, you will find that most users will tell you that uh, if you react or respond, rather, within 100 milliseconds, it feels instant. You add a couple hundred more milliseconds to that, some people will notice a delay. After about a second, there's oftentimes a context switch. It's like it's been so long that I'm already thinking about the next thing. And then finally, about after 10 seconds, you just forget it. It's broken. Chances are you've closed the tab, or you loaded the page, you're doing something else entirely. So that kind of sucks. 
And you look at that and you say, great, okay, so the magic number is 100 milliseconds, right? Like, we'll, we'll figure this out. We'll just make everything under 100 milliseconds. Well, not so fast, because it turns out that our wetware also has many peripherals and inputs, and those inputs by themselves have different properties. So, for example, for visual processing, uh, you will find that 24 FPS, 16 to 24 FPS, is kind of like the minimal viable product for having something that doesn't suck. Uh, at least it, it, you don't see stutter when you see the, that FPS. But 24 FPS is also not enough, because for a great experience, you actually need 60 frames per second. So the optimal time, or the amount of time that you have to do all of the work is about 16 milliseconds, which is a very short span, right? So we already reduced that 100 milliseconds to 16 for uh, visual processing. And then you look at something like audio, and you discover that actually we can detect one millisecond jitter, which also explains why we go to such great lengths for things like audio and VoIP, where we use different protocols, because we just can't accept any sort of delays in packet processing. But at the same time, we are willing to accept packet loss. So we can just drop packets on the floor, and we can just play the audio with gaps, and you guys won't even notice. And you can accept that uh, in, in this case, but obviously we can't do that in every case. And uh, there's actually a couple of really great talks lined up at this conference that we're going to talk about. If you ever wondered what's so magical about 60 FPS, uh, Paul Bacaus has a great talk. I believe he's presenting tomorrow on frames per second. And uh, Chris Wilson is doing a talk on media APIs, where he's going to talk about uh, the APIs that are available on the platform, uh, uh, high precision scheduling for audio and all that stuff. So I definitely encourage you to check that out. So when we talk about perceived performance, really what we're talking about is a function of multiple things. There's the actual performance. That's the stuff that we usually or we can measure on, on the chip. There's the expected performance, which is the wetware and what it expects the app to do or the, that interaction to be, uh, how it should behave. And then finally, we have the UX, and that's the glue. And that's where we need to uh, think about what we need to think about to optimize this perceived performance. So all of this to say is that performance is not just milliseconds, frames, and megabytes, and all those things that we love to measure. It's also how all of those translate into how the user perceives the actual uh, experience with that application. And we'll take a look at some examples. Uh, but before we do that, one interesting question to ask is, so who's responsible for this? Right? I'm a developer. I write code. I work on the uh, infrastructure of my servers. Uh, am I supposed to worry about this? And my answer is yes, uh, because to optimize this perceived performance, there's, there's a reason why it's a function of all of those things, right? So we need to work together. It's not, I can't just hand over uh, all of the UX to the visual designer and say, fix it. Uh, we can come up with some creative solutions to make this better. And uh, Steve Satters is also giving an awesome talk on illusion of speed, where he actually covers a lot of great examples, both in the online and the offline world, for how different uh, uh, people have optimized these sorts of experiences, kind of in counterintuitive ways and funny ways. So definitely check that out as well. So here's an example that I uh, struggle with on a daily basis. Uh, if you guys are not familiar, you don't recognize the site. This is Hacker News. So I end up on the site at least once a day, uh, and uh, I have a love-hate relationship with it, because technically, the site is really fast. It's a single HTML page. It's got three kilobytes of CSS. It's got 500 bytes of GIFs, sorry, GIFs. And it renders almost reliably in under 500 milliseconds. So by all technical metrics, this is an awesome page, except I can tell you from my personal experience that the experience actually sucks. And here's the reason why. I come to the site because I want to know the latest tech and startup-related news, except the page loads really fast. But it always takes me at least a couple of seconds to realize that the page is loaded, but I can't really read anything because it's so small. I have to register the fact that, hey, oh, right, yeah, this is Hacker News. Uh, I shouldn't be waiting for anything. Now I'm on my own. I double tap. It zooms in. It's still too small. I start pinch and zoom, I start, and I'm uh, swiping to, to read the headlines. And you can never get this right. So the actual time for me to answer my original intent or my original task is on the order of 5 to 10 seconds. And it's a miserable experience, and I hate it. So this points to something interesting, which is there's this concept of a user task. right? There's, there's an intent of why it came to this app or to the site, and it's not fulfilling it. It's fulfilling the technical aspects. It doesn't match, 
uh, match my experience, and it definitely uh, fails on the UX part of it. So the one takeaway here is ask yourself, what are the primary user tasks in your app? What is the time to that task completion? I think finally, as a community, we have moved past the onload time, I hope. So now we're talking about render time. How long did it take for the app to come up and become useful such that I can render it on the screen? But even that metric, if you think about it and think back to the Hacker News example, is actually not that useful because the page rendered really fast, but it wasn't useful content because then I had to pinch zoom and, and swipe and do all this kind of work. So really, it's, you should be measuring how long did it take me to get the, those headlines? And that's what the thing that you should be measuring. So recall that I mentioned that uh, this wetware has a lot of interesting quirks. Well, let's look at some examples. This is a fun one. So in the early days of Blogger, uh, when they moved to the Google infrastructure, uh, they actually made the whole sign-up process so fast that you, uh, you would go in, you would fill out the name of your blog, a bunch of information, and then you click the Create Blog button. And that process, that step was so fast that you would just return immediately and say, like, great. Uh, the blog's created, except most users expected that process to take a lot longer, right? And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. Like, this is actually a big commitment on my part. Uh, I'm creating a new blog, one. Two, you're creating a website for me. Like, you got to do all this extra work. It's, it seems like a big thing to do. And instead, the app just returns immediately. So they thought the experience was broken when, when they got that fast uh, page. Most people thought something went wrong, so they click back and, and kind of fiddle around and only then realize that the page actually worked. So small fix, quick fix, add a spinner and a page that does absolutely nothing for a couple of seconds and then take them to the destination. And all of a sudden, the user satisfaction goes up, everybody's happy, and that is a great example of where the user expectation, the wetware expectation, is different from the reality of the actual technical uh, specification of this thing. So that's an example uh, of too fast. Of course, I, sh you know, I shouldn't have to provide many examples of being too slow, but here's an interesting example that I run into all the time. So this is a contrived example, uh, but I guarantee you that you have something similar in your application. So let's talk through it. Uh, I built this little platform for uh, doing analysis. And, or I have a database, let's say, with orders or something else. And I want to provide an ability for my analysts or uh, analytics people to kind of query it and, and find out interesting things about the data. The problem is when I give him this tool, I gave him access to the database uh, to run some aggregations. But those users have no understanding of things like indexes and data cubes. When they write that query, they expect it to return a, a, an answer quickly. Uh, but because they, they're not aware of these concepts, it seems like it's almost random. Sometimes they'll hit an index and they get a response quickly. Sometimes it'll be very slow. And because of that, if you ask most users, they'll tell you that performance sucks because it's basically random. You might as well give me a slot machine and, le and let me just you know, pull it on every, on every query. So that's not good. Uh, but there's simple ways to fix this. Uh, you can do uh, validation on the fly. Is this a valid query? Why should the user even have to wait? Give them feedback for how much data you're going to process. And in fact, you know, arguably, that 27 gigabytes is not a good uh, metric because that may not mean anything to a non-technical user. You should give something that can approximate it in seconds. And I know that many of you will throw up your hands and say, look, this is very hard. Uh, I can't estimate it until I run it. True, it's hard, but not impossible. Right? And what we're doing here is optimizing perceived performance. And the reason I say that something like this exists in your app is because this is an example of a fast path and a slow path in your application. You always have a fast path and a slow path in your application. So think about how to bridge that expectation or how to fix that expectation by providing better feedback. So finally, you know, we have perceived performance, which is a function of expected performance and actual performance. And experience, I would argue, is actually this perceived performance aligned with task completion. Because again, you can actually build something that is technically fast, that is perceived to be fast, but doesn't actually fulfill my goal. You maybe you served the wrong information to begin with. Right? And that is what you should be optimizing. You should be optimizing for experience. So when we, when we talk about perceived performance, it's a function of all of these things together. So some things to think about. What is the user trying to achieve? And 
After you can answer that, what does the wetware between our ears expect? Depending on the medium, whether it's a game or you're playing with audio or doing something else, you have different limitations and different expectations. Next is, what are the technical performance constraints given your platform and the things you have to do? Maybe you have to process a terabyte of data. Well, let the user know. And then finally, how do you connect those two? That is where you have to bring in the UX and connect those pieces together to help me succeed in this task. So as developers, I think we need to learn about the wetware. And we need to think about the user, task, uh, user tasks. And as designers, we need to learn about the technical and wetware constraints and design for task completion. And it is, it is the intersection of those two things together that will actually give us performance. So with that, Perf matters. Thank you.